Okay. Okay. Uh oh, hang on. There we go. Well, thanks. It's great to be here again for part two. Uh, I recognize some of you were part one. I'm not sure about the others. So um, those of you who missed part one, you can get the recording, I understand. It's already available. And in that uh, yesterday evening, we really spent time on what is visualization, how to really um, use it and create it and how powerful it is. Today, what we're going to do is spending time really focusing on strategies for improving reading, spelling, and creative writing skills. And then tomorrow, well, uh, not tomorrow, on Tuesday, we'll uh, use visualization for sports and performance. So I'd appreciate it if you uh, please ask questions, but we'll answer them at the end. We had a great discussion last night. So I'll just review just briefly uh, the see it, say it, do it process, because we're going to be doing that process throughout today and Tuesday's presentations. Really the process that I've created based on a lot of people's work um, is to see it or visualize, declare it, say it, and take action, like an action plan. When you do those three steps, and they don't have to be in that order, but when you do those steps, you get the tada, you get the transformation. And really, I have almost always seen whether you want to do well on a test or or do great in sports, or you're creating a new project or a building, it takes this type of a process to really be able to accomplish what your intention is. And so we're going to see how that all works through the academic realm. So let's talk about see it, say it, do it for learning. You all probably know who this wise character is, Albert Einstein, and he's so famous with so many quotes, and he talks uh, so much, in, in, and listen to his his verbiage, it's often visual kinds of words. If I can't picture it, I can't understand it. So again, yesterday when we talked about the language of imagery, the visual words like notice, I see it, um, let's look, versus more of the other sensory words, keep in touch, I hear you. I, I don't feel it, I have a gut feeling. So I hope you had a chance uh, last night and today, start listening to your own language and the people that are around you, even if it's six foot away, <laughs> listen to their language and you'll be able to understand better how that person is processing. In 2009, I had decided, it was interesting, I spoke at COVD, I believe in 2008. It was an all day um, workshop on the power of visualization. And I thought it really went well. And I remember saying at the very end to myself, like, wow, this needs to be written down, but it's not going to be me because I don't like to write. Well, that was in November. In December, I happened to go to a um, um, course called Never Work Again. And they were talking about uh, different ways of income. And, and um, somebody got up there and said, you know, you could always sell books, but you really don't make a lot of money most of the time on selling books. But he kept saying, you always have a book inside of you. Everybody has a book inside of you. And I go, not me. I have another talk, but I don't have a book. I hate to write. And by the time that conference is over, I had this book inside of me. And it was really the visualization seminar that I had just given. And so I went on a limb to really put my thoughts, my ideas, uh, my 40 years of experience in vision therapy, I work in personal development to really develop a series of books. First one called See It, Say It, Do It. And you're gonna see a lot of references and pictures and stories from them. But I was really pretty concerned because I felt it was outside of the you know, regular optometry world. This wasn't about binocularity and accommodation, ocular motor so much. It was really about processing, visual processing, visual motor integration. And so it happened to be at that time that I was asked to speak at a wonderful conference called Learning in the Brain. It's in the US, it's at two or three sites from Stanford to Harvard to University of Chicago. And they get the, some of the best scientists in the field of education psychologists. 
and they had asked me to speak about vision therapy, which was quite unusual because I think I was the only visual person uh, on the agenda for I don't know how many meetings. I happened to listen to a lecture by Dr. Judy Willis, who's the author of this book. She's a neurologist turned middle school teacher. And now she's retired and mainly does seminars. Her book had so much of the same kind of information about visualization. I was shocked. It was very confirming. Here we have somebody who's a neurologist talking about brain function and how kids learn through understanding the brain. And she had some, some of the very similar kinds of information and activities that I did. And here's a quote out of her book. Again, she's a neurologist. Students learn to do visualizations, deliberately recalling in detail a place where they felt happy, calm, and safe. And those of you who were with us yesterday, you remember how we talked about safe was so important. Wherever that safe may be, me. It could be in your house, it could be in the mountains, it could be at the ball game, it makes no difference. But you need to have a place where you feel happy, calm, and safe. If you're interested, her book is great because it also gets into a lot more language processing. And she gives a lot of stats on, you know, people that are born in, you know, very poor communities or um, just how these principles stand no matter where you're born, no matter what class system you are. So let's talk about reading now. What is the purpose of reading? Many of you might know Steve Ingersoll, optometrist. And the purpose of reading is to get the picture in the writer's head into the reader's head. The picture in the writer's head. In other words, whatever I wanted to create, I wrote in written language, the reader reads the written language and it creates a picture in their head, or it should. That's the purpose of reading. I love it when parents come into the office and I'll say, so how's his reading? Oh, he's such a great reader. He reads so quickly. His only problem is comprehension. And it's like, oh my gosh, if you don't have comprehension, you have nothing. So it's really about getting that information into the reader's head. So when you have reading problems, it's always you know, a question, is it all a visual problem or is there a language processing problem? I learned this the very, very hard way early in my practice, like 30 years ago where I had a little kiddo who was about nine years old, could hardly even read first grade. He should be in about fourth grade. And he um, showed that he had an intermittent extropia, his oculomotor skills were terrible, poor visual motor. And I was sure I was gonna fix him. I was gonna you know, improve the fusion, the tracking, all of these skills, and he'd be a great reader. And sure enough, we improved, he had stereopsis, his eye rarely went out his track, everything was better. And I thought, wow, this is cool. This was great. And on our final checkout, the mother says to me, you know, Johnny was just diagnosed with dyslexia. That's why he can't read. And I was like, what? I had no idea of some of the other problems. And I was just sure I was going to be the miracle worker by improving his visual skills. So it sent me on a course is to find out more about reading and understand better where we as developmental optometrists fit into the scheme of the whole reading process. And I've learned a lot of this from working with, surrounding myself with excellent tutors so I know what I can treat and be successful at. And then I know who and when I need to send these patients for language and or reading therapy. So again, there's uh, a number of educators, especially in the community, um, dyslexic community, who are convinced vision has nothing to do with reading. They will stand there and go, it is all a language-based problem. I go, really? They go, you're not gonna change my mind, Sarah. I said, well, can I do an experiment? They said, yes. I said, pick up your book. So I have them pick up a book or paper. I said, hold it so you can read it. And they hold it. And I say, great, close your eyes. Now read it. And they just sit there waiting for something to happen. Then they open their eyes and go, what? And I think it's hysterical. I mean, how can you say vision has nothing to do with reading? They go, well, yeah, you have to see, but that's all. And so there are many educators that still are convinced that it's an all language-based problem. 
and there's getting to be more and more great um, uh, information and uh, studies on types of reading difficulties and there's visual dysfunctions and language and so often it's a multi dysfunction. So the biggest question is how do you feel when you read? Because if it's so painful and you hate it, this is where the see it, say it, do it process comes in. And this started again, you know, you know our patients give us all our good information on our teaching. We um, had a little gal come in, she was uh, seven years old and I'm ready to do a progress, uh, an examination on her. And I said, how's school? Fine. How's reading? She just broke into tears. She was just crying and crying and crying. I go, whoa, well, let's step back for a minute. And let's go to, uh, where would you like to go in our mind just for fun? So again, here's where we start using the see it, say it, do it process. So she said, I, she said, she immediately stopped crying. She goes, oh, I love to swim. I said, well, let's pretend we're swimming together. This is right in the exam room, okay? So we're swimming together and I'm going like, hey, catch this. And I just, you know, kind of like throw something. She goes, what is that? I said, it's the magic waterproof book. Oh my gosh. She tends to dunk it. She says, can I open it and read it? Uh, okay if you want so again <clears throat> when we put her in a safe place she chose a safe place i went there with her to learn about it she now could start looking at the book whereas before i mentioned the word read and she broke into tears as we the reason i really got involved in some of this is often we'd improve their visual skills so well they often even read better but they didn't see themselves as good readers. They still saw themselves as being dumb or slow or hating reading. And I used to ask him, tell me, pretend like you're reading to your class. What do you notice? And you'd see them and you could actually, too bad we didn't measure you know, their, their skin and their temperature and their pulse because you see the anxiety just come in. And, and I said, so what do you notice? He goes, I'm so little and all the kids are big out there and they're laughing at me. So that's the picture that this little kid, seven years old, has in his head. So I said, you know, can you play with your pictures? Remember we talked about manipulating, managing your pictures? And, she's, and he said, yes. I said, so let's pretend we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna blow you up nice and big, however you wanna do it. And the kids do the funniest things, you know, they'll pretend they're pumping up or big. And then they'll often get bigger and you'll see their whole demeanor change, their body changes. I go, what just happened? They go, where'd the kids go? They're so little down there. And I said, so before you ever read to the class again, I want you to kind of blow yourself up really so you're big. And they said, can I do that? And they go, remember, this is yours. Nobody can change or has control over it except for you. And so that's the quick prep. So as much as we talked about some visualizations and more complex uh, activities, that's how quick you can just jump right into it. So their picture, their visualization matches what they're saying. And then it gives them a lot more confidence than go do it. So let's just review reading as a very complex task. You know, our brains were not made to read. Our brains automatically were, you know, created to see and hear the senses. Reading is very complex. First, you have decoding. And you know, you know when you see patients, people miss all the words and decoding is this and, and dyslexia. When somebody says, I have dyslexia, you know, there's family history of dyslexia and so, the definitions of these words is very confusing within education, within parents and the uh, public population, and even in optometry. So decoding, that is a necessary skill to figure out words, to really individually listen to speech sounds and, and figure out how they're represented by symbols or letters. And if you're reading words in isolation, great, you decode it, you figure out this new word. If you never get past decoding, you'll never read fluently and, and probably won't comprehend, comprehend much. But kids, especially who have had ear infections and auditory processing difficulties, often 
have decoding problems. So you do need to decode for the most part. Sight words, sight words are critical to read fast. When we measure fluency, we never will me measure any reading fluency if they don't know the words on the page. So if you're gonna do visographs and eye movement cameras and things, you need to make sure they know the words because if they don't know the words and they go back to decoding, the fluency is terrible because they're sounding out the words. If you truly wanna see their fluency, they need to know the words. So in English, the sight words um, are confusing. There's and you know, words that don't sound like they look and they just have to learn the sight words. And then comprehension, to me, that is bottom line. I've had kids skip lines, terrible eye movements, but they get 80, 90% comprehension. Yes, they have a problem we wanna treat, but I'm much less concerned about them because they're getting the bottom line. However, what often happens is these kids that have terrible eye movements or terrible binocular accommodative skills, yet they get comprehension, they really have problems with tests because they don't read the instructions. They skip over the words. So uh, in math, it might say, do not add. And they'll see, add. I'll grab that word and I'll do the key word without looking at those little words. So comprehension to me is really what reading's all about. Now at schools, fluency and time and speed, that's, oh, they're very hung up on that. And, and in schools, it's almost always measured in oral fluency, usually. Whereas our eye movement tests often, and most of the time, are silent. Fluency is the last thing that's gonna happen if you had a reading problem. Because so many of these kids spend so much time figuring out words and rereading. You know, fluency and doing it quickly will only happen after all the other pieces are coming together. So what do you need for good reading fluency, which is what schools are really looking for? You need good visual efficiency skills. You need to know all the words on the page. It's better to practice on easy books together, like with a parent or a teacher. If you have harder books, then figure out the words. But when you're working, I tell parents a lot of times they need several books for this kid. They need the really hard book, the story, the Harry Potter, whatever it is that they want you to read to them. Because that's the love of reading. That's really getting information out of reading. Then they need a book that's kind of their challenge book that they work on that school's given them. And then they need an easy book that you read together for fluency. So many of you recognize, it's not a great video on this, but uh, you'll get an idea if you haven't seen it before. This is a visograph. Uh, there's a number of different eye movement kinds of recordings. From the sake of, of practice management for vision therapy, I believe that this, um, Recording is very important for parents. We'll do that before, during, and after therapy. And you'll so often, most of the time, see huge changes in the fluency and or comprehension. So take a look here. And in a second, and you have to look carefully, you're gonna see little black boxes on the second line. You see it, it's going left to the right, to the left to the right, it's jumping over, it's going backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards. And this is actually a simulation of a reading pattern of a patient. And a pair, if we show this to a parent, they go, well, why is it going back and forth like that? And that is the question. And then they'll understand, no wonder he skips lines. No wonder it takes him so long to read. No wonder he hates reading. Then you get a printout, and this is great, because you can actually show on the left side is a pre- vision therapy on the right side is a more of a, a, a good pattern where if you look at this right uh, image, you'll see um, two, two eye movement patterns, left and right eye, and they look like stair steps going from left to right, and then a big jump back to the start of the line and left to right. And parents can see that it's nice like saccadic fixations. Whereas you look at the page on the left side, you'll see a lot of jump back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And so it's really nice that we can count the numbers and we can show these to the parents and they have some idea how the fluency is improving. And again, we get years and years of improvement over the course of vision therapy. So 
So we talked about oral versus silent. Oral reading is a whole nother story. It also involves expressive language and it also involves a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety. Kids often hate to read out loud. The worst thing you can ever do for a kid, have them read out loud and correct them and correct them and correct them. It is humiliating and they'll just not even read anymore. One of the things we'll often do before we do some of the eye movement and reading tasks, and this is something teachers can do as well. And I don't know that I can demo it, I will try it. But if you're interested, um, ballometrics.com has some great little bilateral integration activities. And I have kind of, well, it's a turtle bean bag. And sometimes if you just do a bilateral activity, for example, I might throw it up and down and up and down. Do you see I'm moving my head, my whole body? And then I'm gonna just try using my eyes. And then I may have them do things like cross marches. Or I might have them do like thumb pursuits in a lazy eight. And those of you who went to Nancy Torgerson's lecture this morning and she talked about doing vision therapy remotely, you can do all of these things online. And it's just learning how to be where you need to be for the screen and monitor. But we'll often do these bilateral integration activities. And there are times you'll see improvement in reading fluency just by these warm-ups. So I encourage you to um, you know, do a few warm-ups before a lot of your activities. If you're interested in more detail, this is just a page right out of uh, the Seat Say It Do It book. And it has a step-by-step -step that we've gone through, the suggestions uh, and more explanation. Again, at the end it says, be in a safe environment. Here's another suggestion. So often the kids, like we mentioned, really blow the uh, instructions on a test. And they're often, I mentioned yesterday, a lot of our population are gifted kids. Some of them are great readers and some of them, if it doesn't come quick and easy, they won't do it. So what we'll do with them, with they have to uh, read out loud, we'll tell them to pretend like they're an actor and they're reading to grandma in the last row and act it out. Let the parent or who they're reading with be the other actor. But then they will read each word. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Please mute yourself. Um, they will, you know, we don't, a good reader does not read each word. They read chunks. But if you're having to read out loud, you do read each word. And so telling a, a kiddo to slow down is like a death wish. They'll, you know, parents said, slow down when you read instructions. They go, no, I'm not going to slow down. So we're giving them a whole nother mindset. Be an actor and really show how you can read. Okay. So most of the kids just love when the parent reads to the kids. They love being read to because when you're reading to them, <clears throat> they're creating this great imagery in their head. It's the visualization. They're going beyond even what you're saying. You know, I would never understood. My sister was such a great reader. and She never wanted to see the movie. She wanted to read the book. And I go, why would you do that? Well, if you don't get, get great visualization, when somebody says reading is boring, you can bet they're not getting great visualization. Now they might get great visualization if you read to them, but they have no idea that when they read to themselves, that they are supposed to get that kind of visualization. And so we do a lot of therapy around visualization. Of, we'll read a little story, stop, close your eyes. What do you notice? What was that dog? How many people were there? What color was there? So again, this is like the building awareness, the observation without judgment of your internal visioning. So what if it doesn't happen? We don't, again, I don't use the word visualization very often with my patients. We talk about creating a picture or a movie. 
And if I, when I teach, you know, classes, I'll often, often ask, how many of you are good readers? And usually about half the teachers will raise their hand. And I'll say, when you read, what do you notice? Do you notice the words on the page and your good readers go, no, it's the movie, it's the story, it's in my mind. And the ones that don't like or, or say they're good readers look at them like, what are you talking about? That doesn't happen to me. So good readers have no idea that poor readers don't get that movie. And again, these kids may be great at visualization, but there's almost like a translation problem between the written language making it into pictures. So reading for tests, here's another little help that we do. We want to be a spy. So again, reading slower doesn't work. So I tell them, I don't want you to read the instructions. They go, great, I don't read them anyways. I said, great. I want you to put on your little spy cap, like that, my camouflage hat. And then I want you to catch your monocle or whatever they use. And we're going to play a game of Clue. And if they play the actual game of Clue, they get it. If not, what I'm saying is this paragraph is where all your clues are to solve the problem. And if you're going to be a great detective, you have to get all the clues, which means you can't skip any. And if you know the game Clue, you know, if you skip the weapon, you can go to the right room and the right color and be wrong because you had the wrong weapon. So you have to look at all the clues. And it might mean reading it out loud for a little bit. And again, that's not building a good reader, it's building a compensation skill for at least the test. Because people read differently for different things. If you're gonna read a novel, you're gonna read fluently, might skip words, you usually still get great comprehension. But if you're in science, you really have detailed instructions, then you're gonna have to really pay attention to more of those words. Uh, make sure you read all the information, don't generalize, be accurate, and then answer the mystery question. So again, this is how we're changing the see it, the visualization piece, so they can respond and be more accurate in understanding what's being asked of them. There is actually studies that show when kids read to their pets, their fluency improves. And why do you think that is? I hear the answers out there in cyberland. It's all confidence and remember, judgment. You know, I had a line yesterday say that we need observation without judgment. And so often parents are so frustrated with the kids, the kids are so frustrated themselves and they'll just correct them and correct them and correct them. It's the worst thing you can do to build confidence. You need to get appropriate reading so they don't have as many errors. The hard stuff, you either need to be patient or work with a tutor or a teacher. But the more we correct them as being wrong, the less confident, the less they're gonna to try to even read. And one of the biggest things that we build in reading in vision therapy is confidence on this skill, seeing themselves. So these kids that we actually have better skills, our goal is for them to see that they actually have better skills and build their confidence. Many of you who are athletes know that's how it works. You know, if you run into a bad uh, hitting streak, you lose your confidence. You might have all the skills, but how do you get that confidence back? Well, certainly success. How do you do that? If you keep seeing yourself missing the ball, missing the ball, it's gonna be a tough road to hit the ball again. And so you have to switch both your external and your internal imagery and actions. Okay, let's get to visualization. We do what's called spelling visualization. And there's a lot of way to do this process. It's really very successful for most kids. If it's not, you need to stop it and figure out why. But let me briefly go through this. And I will tell you my therapists are masters on that and, and wish, I wish they were here and they could go through all the activities. This could take an hour or two just going through the spelling visualization. But I'll just give you a brief, brief overview. We'll have them, you know, just sit comfortably and we'll use cards with colors. And let's say they're learning the word cat and we may spell the word out in big letters, big colors. And then we hold it away or sort of up. And the instructions are, I want you to look at that, that word, 
Just take a picture of it, ready? And then we take it away from them. And we may some, say something like, I want you to see that word and tell me how many of those letters are small, tall, or long. And I've shown you, you know, we'll go over this tall, uh, small, uh, short, or long beforehand, but you can see the A and C are within a line, half the line, the H is above, L is above, G is below, Y. So what we're having them do is not even spelling the word correctly. I want you to close your eyes, spell the word cat by saying short, short, tall. So that way we know they're really seeing at least the shape and the size of the letter. What if they're not doing it? You give easier words. You use more color. Color is really important. Color really triggers the brain for memory and all. So sometimes we'll actually have them draw boxes around it. So play. Can you see it? It's long, tall, short, long. Now I'm going to have you all close your eyes and imagine the word play and spell play going backwards using long, tall, short. Ready? Long, short, tall, long. If you really are seeing the word, you could do it forwards or backwards. And let's say the kiddo keeps reversing like two of the letters, play. And they mix up the L and A all the time. Then we'll have them highlight or color or glitter that so that they see, oh, it's tall, short. That's the pattern. So that they can see it even better. And then we may have them write it out. Because spelling is often a see it, write it. So many kids at the you know, kitchen table will spell it right to you. And then they go to write it in their spelling test and they blow it. So it's a see it, write it. Now I had one kiddo, he was great at this, but he sort of needed a trigger, you know, kind of like he used his hand to get him to, himself to look up. So that was his trigger. And his teacher kept coming around to see if he had the, the words printed on his hand. And he didn't, but he, that was just his way of kind of preparing and getting towards that. We had another kid who said, I am not doing this. And I go, why not? It works so well for you. He goes, that's the problem. It's cheating. All the words are written in my brain. <laughs> we go, well, why do you study them? Isn't that what's supposed to happen? So that's how clear and strong it can be. People who have really been diagnosed as dyslexic, which in itself is a whole talk, what is dyslexia, but often spelling is a problem. For most of them, this may be the only way they can learn to spell some of the words because they often have problems with the phonetic sounds. And that's a generalization, but large group of them have um, phonetic difficulties and language difficulties. So see, they're often very visual. So teaching them through a visual means can be very, very helpful for them. So here's a picture of when we, and let them make the picture, let them design it. Kids are creative, they love the art stuff. And again, glitter, or you know, if they play with swords, put the sword right where that L is anything and as soon as they start making up stuff and, and having fun with it they got it so we'll practice spelling forwards spelling backwards i'm going to give you another word and i'm going to trust you're going to do this honestly i want you to see my name hellerstein now i used to not be able to see it all and then I learned, you know, I can break it up any way I want. And I'd see hell or steam. So let's spell it backwards. N-I-E-T-S-R-E-L-L-E-H. So I encourage you to try those things. If you get stuck, then there's a whole process to go through to get it. It's amazing how many people really can do it. They just have never tried it. But the more that we can tap into the imagery, and the instruction then becomes spelling, see it, then write it. And again, the activity is written down, um, it's in the book, and I believe it's on my website. I, I think I have these activities on my website too. And here's a uh, success story from a patient. The changes I have noticed since I started in uh, vision therapy are many. 
First, I have much neater handwriting. Now I can tell my left from my right. My cursive is a lot better than it would have been without Megan, who happens to be one of my therapists. Now, thanks to letter spelling visualization, spelled as well as she could spell it, my memory and ability to, to take a mind picture have improved. With the help of 2D toss, my hand-eye coordination is superb. Vision therapy has very much helped me. How old do you think this little one is? Here's a number of spelling problems. But for a second grader, she's a gifted kid, very visual, spatial, very bright, knows a lot more words than she can spell. But you can understand how these kids really get it and, and learn about it. And this is one of my uh, favorite little stories. This little four-year-old, his brother was in vision therapy and they came in for a progress check. And I say to the brother, so tell me, how are things going? And the little one says, the four-year-old, my brother is doing better in school because he uses a visualization process. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa. And then he goes on to tell us, and I am going to now get into therapy myself and I want to schedule with Cindy. And we're like, okay, whatever. So many of these really bright kids that even though they're really smart and they're really bright, they may have, and they're often strong visually, but they have visual processing, visual motor difficulties. You can be so successful with these kids. And if you're really interested, um, two years ago, Dr. Linda Silverman, who's a very well-known psychologist from the Denver area, she and I gave a talk at COVD about uh, how some IQs have changed pre and post vision therapy. You probably can get the recording from Digivision, and um, it's just really interesting working with this population. It's not all my population, but we've worked with a number of psychologists who find real disparities in IQ testing, especially in the coding and the speed of processing and then sometimes the memory, yet other things are so high and they're gifted. And they'll send those patients over and we often can really be very successful with them. But you have to be careful because many of these patients have subtle, what we call subtle problems, meaning Sometimes there's not an obvious binocular oculomotor problem, but there's disparities. And these disparities are the key to helping really get these kids to function better. So we do a lot of vision therapy in this population. So the summary and spelling. See the picture in your mind. Take a picture of the word in your mind. Describe the picture, tall, short, colors, whatever. And then write the word. Okay, let's move on to math. Some people are just, I don't get it. Sean's so quick in figuring things out in his head, but when it comes to time math tests, you have those kids that you have to, you know, the mad minutes and they have to do so many addition problems and they're so frustrated and they can't do it very well. Well, there's a lot of reasons that people might have math problems. I see a lot of really, you know, when I'll do perceptual testing, they're often very high in the visual processing. And I'll say, oh, he looks like he could be a good math kid. She goes, he's terrible. I go, really? I bet he can figure things in his head or, or he's good at geometry stuff or Legos. You're gonna go, oh, he's a master of those things. But he can't learn his math facts. Or she does poorly on time tests. Or here's the biggie. I can't tell you the number of really good math kids that are in low math classes because so much of math is story problems and they can't read the instructions. So now it blows all of their math and they're really high level in their math thinking skills. Sometimes they really can do math well, but they have such poor visual motor skills, handwriting, they misalign columns or they have backwards numbers, 31, 13. And if they really don't understand the basics of size, shape, form, and they really have significant processing problems. Those are kids that really have significant visual processing difficulties. And then some people just think, oh, it's too much, it's too hard, and they give up before they start. So just as we've done spelling, we do the math facts. We'll make cards like that, and I'll do an example here. This is one of the hardest math facts, and we'll make it the card, and I'll say, what's over here? And they go, I'll have them take a picture, and I'll take a, when they go seven, I go, what's over here? Eight, what's up here? They go, 54. 
Oh, wait, let's look and let's decorate it so it's colorful. And so they learn the 56. Okay, great. Let's do it again. Take a picture. What's over here? Seven. What's over here? Eight. What's up here? 56. Great. What's over here? Eight. What's over here? Seven. What's up there? Oh, I don't know my eights. I don't care. Just look at your picture. And they go, 56? I go, yeah. What's up here? 56 divided by seven. Oh, I don't know division. I don't care. So they get hung up in this classification of math facts. And when we can get them in imagery and use colors and all, sometimes it can be really helpful because they're learning whole patterns at once. Another trick that's very helpful. Some kids have such terrible spacing and writing, they get wrong answers. And what we have them do is just get um, like college ruled notebook paper. I find graph to uh, paper is way too detailed. So with these lined papers, they can often keep their columns better and then do their math more accurately. Creative writing. This is the picture from my daughter when she was in kindergarten. She's great in the artwork. Do you see that? And then their, their job is write about the story. The more detail you have in your picture, either outside picture or inside picture, the more you have to write. When you ask a kid to write a story, I don't have anything to write about. Well, let's picture your last vacation. Oh, I went to the mountains and I wrote this and I, great. Create your picture, write about your picture. Those of you trying to figure out what it says, it's my family is playing on a Ferris wheel. So her pictures are much more advanced than her written language by all means. But again, she loves to write, loves to write stories. And we actually do um, like mind mapping, like if you had to write a picture or a story about boats, you could make and you can use stickies there. Oh, there's service boats. No, these are fun boats. Wait, there's military boats. Oh, I saw a cruiser. Oh, that goes in this boat. No, that goes in that. Because many of these bright kids, when they, they um, brainstorm, they're all over the place and very disorganized. So it allows them to brainstorm. And you're, some of your CEOs who are whiteboarders, you know, they're right in here, right in here, right in here. You can move these stickies around and now you get organized. You can use colors to study all the service boats or, you know, so you can be very, very creative in this. And it helps because many of these kids do not do well at just outlining an organization. They're not that kind of a learner. Dr. Nelson, about yes. five minutes. Thank you. Okay. So here's another activity. If you notice this picture, there's just some little black lines on the bottom. And then did you notice our little patient drew in a, like a jack-o'-lantern kind of thing and first drew it and then had this whole story to write about it. So again, write about the story. The more information, the more detail the story, more the right. So writing rules, write about your pictures and let it flow. Great writers say do not correct the spelling, the editing, the sloppiness when they're letting it flow. Now the problem is then they need to go back and edit and they hate that. But if you stop them with every letter and, and um, period and all that, they'll just stop writing. Here's a picture of a little guy, three time post-surgery, been patched, patched for amblyopia, high plus prescription. After the third surgery, the doctor said, yep, you're good to go, everything should be good. And the kid then was referred to us because this was his handwriting. He was a gifted kid who couldn't read very well. After vision therapy, there was his handwriting and we didn't really work on handwriting. We worked on all the things you all do, oculomotor, binocular accommodation, visualization. But this little guy was so bright. He said when he was done, my writer was crammed in me and squished. Now it's getting bigger. Seven years old, gifted, isotropia. So again, the power that you can have is amazing. Even though he never got, you know, to 20 second stereopsis or all these other skills that we could really improve his function. So just because of time, I'm gonna go through a couple of these quickly. You know, time tests are the, 
are really a major problem for a lot of people. I mean, look how early we see signs of stress. That's my little niece on the first day of daycare. Like, look at the hands, look at the, do you see that? Wouldn't you like to just see if she could blow out the candle, you know, get a breath and relax? And so teaching these skills at a very early age is very important because, you know, they may start that way, but boy, the stressors come quickly. So when you have time test anxiety, often you can't even see the paper. You're so frustrated and you can't think and you run out of time. And people just see this big time clock, their stopwatch in there. We go through an imagery of breathing, relaxing, practicing, going to the place step by step. Even at a, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll work with COVD um, docs and therapists who are going for their fellowship and they're so nervous. And we did a visualization just like we've been talking about. And this was one of the notes back to me after it was just like a 30 minute visualization of relaxing, calming. We'll do that um, probably on Tuesday. And she said, you helped me create my true intention, which is what, that I want to do a great job. I want to shine. I know what I know and I can do it. Listen to the, she sees herself, she says it and sure enough, she got her fellowship. Now, you know, early in my practice, I thought, you know, I'd find out if they're visualizing if we, if they weren't, we couldn't go into the academics part. We had to go through all of the parquetry blocks and everything. And I don't feel it's on a linear learning level. I believe you can start some of this visualization from day one. It may be much more basic and not abstract, but you can be doing things right along as you're working on a lot of your visual processing skills like so eric would you want to have the same shapes? and um yeah. i'm sure a lot of you do parking blocks if you've ever taken bob sennett's class what i want you to do uh, bob and linda were kind enough to really write the chapter on parking blocks for me in my book and make it the same uh, all different levels outside the scope of today's here. course okay but yes we if do I a lot of this visual paper, processing on top of yours it's going to match and i call it just really included in or visualization work. You know, acknowledgement and pats on the backs, especially to yourself, is a big deal. Sometimes our homework of vision therapy is to share at the dinner table something you can pat yourself on the back for. And you should see that parents often go, I don't have to do that, do I? I mean, I can't take acknowledgement. And so it's something that you know, we want them to be able to see and acknowledge themselves and for a good effort, not necessarily getting the aid, but all about their efforts. Resources, there's, um, there's tons of resources. These are my books. Uh, the one we've referenced today mainly is the See It, Say It, Do It, and the Organize the Book down below, um, Power of Your Child's Imagination, in fact, I just noticed Dr. Resnick, uh, I just got, uh, she's having a uh, webinar on how to deal with your kids' fears from this COVID uh, difficulty. And so uh, that's another one, great book. But what would you do? What would you do in your life if you knew you would be outrageously successful? So if you imagine just for a moment, there were no barriers, you were gonna be successful at whatever you wanted to be what would you do I encourage you all that it's really time to make a difference for yourself your kids your students and take action now create create what you want you usually know that but it gets pushed down and we lose our passion see you know again Nancy said that too really see that passion and then go for it, see it, declare it, and then do it. And with that, I thank you very much and I left time for questions. So let me stop sharing my screen here. All right, Kelly. There we go, hi there. I've got some questions for you. Great. Uh, we have one from Susan. She's asking. Actually, Hannah. I signed in as mum. Oh. It's Hannah. Oh, Hannah. Oh, I'm sorry. I was, I was reading a question from somebody else. No, 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 no. It's yeah. Hannah. 
logged in as Susan. Oh, I see. I gotcha. You're Hannah. Okay. Do you want to ask the question? Uh, so I was wondering whether you also introduce tactile when you're doing visualization spelling. So if they were spelling the word ice, if you used an ice cube, or if they were spelling the boat, you put a toy boat in their hand so that they're getting the tactile feedback alongside the visualization. Yeah, very much. And again, I gave a very quick overview cursory. Um, like we mentioned yesterday, it's very multi-sensory. Tactile, either in the air, on the wall, in sand, in um, uh, shaving cream, uh, feeling it. They can't see it. See the boat, feel the boat, see letters with it. So we, we really do a much more multi-sensory approach than in the short time I just gave you an overview of. Thank you for that. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have another one from Monica. She's asking, what activity would you use to introduce visualization into your VT sessions? Well, it really just appears at the moment. It could be um, with a, a tough kid that you just want to play a game. And again, I'll just bring up the ape. My ape is purple. What color is your ape? I don't have an ape. Let's pretend you had an ape. What color is your ape? It's green. Well, mine has a hat. What, you know, so right away you have that. Before, um, we talked about even like Brock String, when you breathe, and relax and so often when you're working on divergence, pretend that you are, you're already doing a lot of visualization work just in your language. I think you just don't know that. But um, parquetry blocks, now look at the pattern. Now close your eyes for just a moment and see that in your mind. So, you know, almost every activity, you can do a bilateral activity like a, a roadmap or an obstacle course just two things with a little kid and you go, close your mind. Where is the first chair? Show me there. Now, where's the second chair? Show me there. Show me how you're going to go. Very good. You know, so you can bring in visualization instead of what I used to do of uh, all the therapy activities. And then the last block was visualization. It goes on in more and more depth from day one. And then when do we do, you know, more, involve sessions it depends on the kiddo and it's usually when uh there's a lot of anxiety or stress or i can't do it and things like that all right i've got one more here uh what are some relaxation techniques other than telling patients to roll their shoulders back take a deep breath stand up straight imagine that they're at the beach etc well uh, yesterday um we actually went through that and you're welcome to listen more depth, but uh, breathing and teaching them how to breathe. Put your hands on their, they put their hands on their belly or lay down and put you know, a book on their belly or lay on their stomach and really feel themselves breathing. Or doing a body scan of tightening and relaxing and tightening and relaxing. So um, sometimes just jumping on a mini tramp. Uh, if you come into our office, and this was so interesting, and we loved it when we went to Spain, Cindy, I think you're on the call, where we had fun, and we were laughing through the whole presentation, and that's how it is every day at our office. And there's actually studies to show for best learning, and this is not just like, oh, big deal, for best learning, you have to have fun. So bringing in humor, I hate to tell you another important factor in how to help kids learn the best. This is all, this came from the Learning the Brain Conference, was gambling. You go, what? Well, how about, I, I bet you can't jump that far. No way. Well, you tell that to your kid, what do you think they're going to they're gonna do? Um, so playing games and being involved and laughter and having fun, that's all relaxing. If it's like, I can't get it, I can't get it, I can't get it, you know, and they're holding their breath, well, let's breathe into it, first of all. Because when you breathe out, it will really open your periphery. I've always wanted to do a study on syntonic fields with breathing and just see if and how much fields might open with, um, you know, breathing step strategies. So I encourage you, you know, listen to the first lecture. There's more activities in the book and 
if you just Google that, uh, there's lots of great uh, information online about relaxation for kids. Yoga. Great. All right, what else? Okay, I've got this one. This person is asking if they're like, what would be the youngest and what would be maybe the oldest patient that you would work with visualization? How early can you start? Is there a too late age? Oh gosh, I used to work with my little grandkids at two and a half, three years old. Uh, a quick story, I'm not gonna tell you all the story because we're, um, because. <laughs> um, my little one used to have nightmares and she'd wake me up in the middle of the night and I, I'm not good getting up in the middle of the night. And she'd call me and she'd be crying and she'd go, I have all these goblins, they're so scary. And I go, oh really, what do they look like? She goes, oh, they've got this and they've got this and they're big. And they're Oh, well, what can we do to make that goblin look funny? Well, let's cut off his legs. And now he's wobbling around. I go, good. And I'm going to paint his face all funny colors. Okay. And then ah, I'm going to take off his underwear. <gasps> you know, at that toddler age, that's what they say. Now, I wouldn't have guided an imagery like that. But the whole point is, it's her imagery and it's age appropriate language of what makes them laugh. And now she has all of these funny goblins that'll hide because they don't want to be seen and they went away and she never woke up again with another, another story. So you can start with your little, little, little kids. How old? I don't think there's an age limit. I've done this with adults, with geriatrics. Um, when my dad was in the hospital and he was very ill, and they wanted to do a lung bi biopsy on him and he's sitting there like this and they go, hold still, hold still. And I go, just a minute. And he postured, my sister's an OT, so she helps posture him, gave him support. I said, look at me here and let's breathe together. Ready? Breathe with me. They got that biopsy just like that. We'll do it when you're doing um, tonometry. You know, a lot of people, even Goldman, they get really tense. Sit back for a moment. Let's breathe. Okay, now come on in and imagine. So that kind of languaging happens all day, every day. It's not even programmed as an activity. It's just part of our languaging of how we work with people. All right, Lynn, I think that's all I have. Any all right. Questions? So yeah, thank you so much. Very good. We will see you on Tuesday for part three. I thank everybody. I hope to see you. Um, have a good couple safe days and just start creating. Take action and just start creating something in your life that you've always wanted to do and be. Thank you. Good night, everybody, or good morning. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.